Marietta is Dean of the Center for Economics, Politics, and History at UATX. Formerly, he taught at the University of Massachusetts Lowell and served as Chair of Political Science at UT Arlington. With a focus on political psychology and constitutional politics, he's the author of four books, A Citizen's Guide to American Ideology, A Citizen's Guide to the Constitution and the Supreme Court, The Politics of Sacred Rhetoric, Absolutist Appeals and Political Persuasion, and One Nation, Two Realities, Dueling Facts in American Democracy. We sat down on a stormy Thursday evening to chat about his writing and research, UATX, the Austin Union, and the marketing of bourbon and cigarettes, among many other things. This interview is a bit longer than usual, but is definitely worth the listen. I enjoyed it thoroughly, and I hope you do too. Happy listening. Morgan, thanks so much for coming on to the show. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. You know, it's it's George Washington's birthday today, so I feel it's especially appropriate that I get to talk to a constitutional scholar. Ah, oh, thanks. Thanks. Uh, as you know, uh, one of the great debates of the current day is what people think of the founding generation and how seriously it should be taken and whether we're smarter than the founders or the founders are smarter than we are and several important questions. Well, we have better teeth, that's for sure. That is definitely true. Yes. <laughs> I think they have Washington's wooden teeth in, in a museum somewhere. Uh, yes. Yes, they do. Okay, here's an easy question. What is America? What was so revolutionary about the creation of a democratic republic in 1776? Age of monarchs, Europe, we wow. come to the new world. Answer however you want. What is America? Oh, I'm glad you're <laughs> starting off with the, uh, the softball questions. Uh, I had not prepared that one. Uh, but the founding is about the birth of the idea of rights. It's, it's, it's about the, the birth of a government devoted to the very simple idea that we are creatures of rights. And I ask students this in class frequently, do you have rights? Are you a creature of rights? And they always say yes, uh, but they have very little sense of why and why they believe that when most of the world doesn't. And they have very little sense that that was a new and deeply radical idea at the time of the founding. And they have a certain sense of what content that means, what rights those are. Once you're convinced that you are a creature of rights, which rights you hold. Mm. Uh, and of course, that is deeply disputed in the current day. One of the most important things I think about that whole question, and uh, this brought up about the, the importance of the recognition of the founding and the unique nature of it. For a long time when I was studying constitutional law, it was just assumed, and I was an undergrad, 88 to 92, and then a graduate student in the late 90s, early 2000s. And it, it was assumed that the world was moving in the direction of agreement with the ideas of the founding, that we are all creatures of rights. And the only question was, which rights? And the world has dramatically moved against that in more recent times. And it's clear that it's not just an American conversation, it's a worldwide conversation, which is trending the other way. And I always say to students when the question comes up of why do we study constitutional laws? Because we can. Hmm. And most places you can't, and we still can. And that's why we have to study it. I think that's uh, the gist. Maybe there's better answers as to uh, what America is or what the founding is, but that's what I think it is. Well, I want to push back a little bit on the idea that rights was novel at the end of the 18th century. If you go back to the late 1600s, John Locke and the Second Treatise on Government talked about an al an ali inalienable mm -hmm. rights. Uh, the French Revolution obviously preceded the American Revolution. So, no, it obviously did not. Seventeen. Yes, the other way around. <laughs> excuse, yeah. excuse me. Yeah, um, no, that's actually that's an interesting question that uh, people talk about. There's a um, Talladega Nights. Have you ever seen that film? I have the, seen uh, Talladega Nights. I'm not sure how it fits here. <laughs> no, no, because the because uh, the French guy uh, has this 
line where he says that the French invented democracy. And a lot of people seem to have that view, but it, uh, the, the French Revolution the was... Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I guess it, 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 it all depends what you mean. That's a really great, a great question. We should talk about it in a minute. But the French Revolution was inspired by ours and then very, went very bad and excessive and started lopping off heads. And there's a, <laughs> there's a distinct argument that our version is the better version. This has a lot to do with comparative constitutionalism, which is a great topic to talk about. If, when you talk about a constitution, are you talking about ours? Are you talking about the world? Or did they emulate us? Or should we put them all together? But uh, see, I see where you're going with this question. We didn't invent the idea of rights in the American founding. And in we, many but senses, we encoded it into the right. founding of the country. Yeah, that's the exactly basis, right. The basis of America was mm -hmm. these inal inalienable rights. We decided that it was real in a true sense that an entire society would endorse and an entire government would be centered on the idea of its purpose of protecting those rights. It was all suggested up until that point. And at that point, there was the first attempt to a good point. write it and codify it and make it a written constitution. And you can say that other countries, England, for example, had unwritten constitutions or constitutions that are written in different pieces that you have to cobble together. But the, the great innovation was the constitution of the American constitution is to write it down in a way that is not meant to be alive, but is meant to be enforced and is meant to teach future generations that they are creatures of rights and what this means. Before that, it was always either suggested or even a lie or something that hadn't even been thought of. There's this conversation that I like to have with students about Greek democracy. And mm. you, as you were saying, you go, oh, no, the Greeks invented it. No, 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 no. The, the Greeks invented majority rule. And the idea that the comparison was a monarch or a dictator, one person rule versus the rule of the majority. And any of us, if we had trouble with the state, we would prefer a majority to vote on whether we were punished rather than just one dictator at his own whim deciding if we were punished. Mm -hmm. So majority rule democracy was a massive improvement over divine right of kings or of tyrants. But that's not the innovation of the American Revolution. The, the innovation of the American founding is rights, is a limitation even on that majority rule by the rights of the individual. And that has set up the American question and the worldwide question ever since then. The way that I always phrase this is that when Socrates was condemned by the majority rule of his city, why didn't he say, wait, you can't do that, I have rights. He killed himself. He not only accepted their verdict, he carried it out himself, killed himself because the majority told him to. And they asked that question, why didn't he say, oh, no, no, you can't do that, I have rights. No one had thought of that yet. The concept of rights didn't exist. He thought majority rule was the apex of human achievement. So he followed it. And when the majority told him to kill himself, he killed himself because the concept of rights had not been born, and it hadn't been born until the time period that you're talking about. And then we made it part of the written DNA of the society. And that, I still think, is the, the great, truly great innovation. It's interesting. You said you were an undergrad from 88 to 92. Yeah. Where were you in 89? No, Where were I you? Was, <laughs> oh, no, this is actually, I'm glad you mentioned this, because I was just thinking about this the other day. Uh, as you know, at University of Austin, we're establishing this brand new university with some uh, very innovative ideas. And we're rethinking a lot of the ways that universities run in the sense that the question at most universities in the current day is, well, how have we always done it? And people might make marginal changes, uh, but they even rarely even do that. But they certainly haven't rethought basic questions like how university education ought to work. And I was just thinking the other day about my own undergrad experience. It was 88 to 92, mm. and it was deeply shaped. And I think everybody's undergraduate experience, to some degree, is shaped by two things. It's shaped by the national or worldwide events that happened mm. during that time yeah. period. 
and it's shaped by the random people you meet, students and faculty. And mm -hmm. Mine was devoutly shaped by both these things, the worldwide events and the professor that I ran into. And the worldwide events were uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 89. And then the other one, oddly, that really uh, shaped my experience was the Clarence Thomas, Anita Hill hearings mm. in 91. And uh, that dramatically shaped how I understand psychology and politics. But on the uh, first one, that's one of the reasons that I started to study what I do in terms of belief systems, ideology, what I call the political consequences of belief. Mm -hmm. This idea that Marx was fundamentally wrong and Hegel was fundamentally right, that his ideas all the way down. It's actually what's in people's heads that shape the world. And not the Marxian idea that it's what's in the world that shapes people's heads, that it's actually beliefs that are the prime actors and understanding what is mm -hmm. in people's heads is the primary social science question. In uh, 89, I watched for a year or two the Marxist faculty be very sad in the hallways. Hmm. And their worldview had been disproven in this way. It was sort of a, a worldwide refutation of an idea. And the thing that started to really interest me was not just what these different ideologies were arguing, and th th of course they're very different, but why certain ones are so much more persuasive than other ones. And Marxism is shockingly um, seductive. You can disprove it over and over and over again. And it has been disproven historically over and over and over again. Yet I still hear the argument, oh, it just hasn't been done right. Oh, we need to do it one more time. And I always think, oh, how many times do you need to do it? Uh, but watching the Marxist faculty be rather sad about things and this whole uh, conversation that was happening at that time of what does this mean now? Does it mean it's the end of history? Is Fukuyama okay. right about this? Which even then I thought that was completely wrong. Was uh, Huntington right that the class of civilizations had begun? Uh, but really, watching a, an, a, a worldwide ideological event occur while you're an undergrad and can talk about it mm. on campus is a, a great experience. We weren't able to talk about some of the COVID stuff because we weren't on campus. She couldn't be on campus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's you know that's a great uh, point. That's sort of the opposite of what happened for students during the pandemic. That there was this worldwide physical and ideological event, but they couldn't talk about it. Well, we could in the realm of digital technology, which wasn't you know previously available. You know, there wasn't there was no Facebook and. In, in, 1989, although I'm sure if there was, there, that would be a mode of, you know, students congregating and talking with each other. Um, so we obviously spoke with each other about what was going on, and it became this whole ideological, it took on an ideological character and debates in and around COVID. But we weren't there on campus to, you know, discuss what was happening in the world with each other. And perhaps, you know, mm -hmm. the pandemic perhaps precluded that. But I think, you know, if you're on a campus with a few thousand young people who are there to learn, um, interesting conversations would have been had, perhaps, you know, protests. I don't know. Um, yeah. it's, it's counterfactual to think about. But uh, as a very interesting time to have been an undergraduate, 88 to 92. Um, and then did you take a break before proceeding to doctoral study or did you march right in? I was an army officer. I was an ROTC cadet, and then I served a tour in Korea on the DMZ, mm -hmm. and then I was in Washington, D.C. with one of the agencies there. Mm -hmm. And even that, at that time, though, uh, for me, I came from a very working class background. I didn't know what university was. Uh, I was first generation college. Where are you from? From around Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, my friends, we were all first generation college and uh, almost all of us are faculty now, actually. And uh, <laughs> these were very serious people who wanted to move out of that, but we had no idea how to do it. So we banged around in different ways trying to attend university. And University of Pittsburgh at that time, because I had high SAT scores, they sent me an admission in the mail. 
this is all pre-internet. It's hard for people in the current day to comprehend how these things work. But everything was on paper, and you had to send in applications and things of that nature. But some universities collected SAT scores, and they just sent me an admission to the Honors College at Pitt. Mm. So I just showed up. I literally showed up the day before classes started. I <laughs> got, literally, I got an apartment in the student ghetto for $250 a month. It was a real, <laughs> it was a real rat hole with actual rats. I never, I never lived in the dorms. And I uh, made my way through. I got a 2.5 my first mm. year as an undergrad because I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, and then I figured it out as is, yes, what America is in the sense of the founding, it's one thing. What America is in the sense of culture is that working class people can figure it out and take the great leap forward and become professionals. That is what we do here. And that's how it ended up, but uh, you wouldn't necessarily have predicted it at the time. I think social mobility is certainly characteristic of America and of the United States, but it's not necessarily distinctly, I mean, it's distinctly American, but it's not uniquely American. I think there are right. social, yeah. social mobility in other places yeah. as well, but not, I think, yeah. as a piece of, I mean, you think about like a piece of the national consciousness, the American dream is yeah. some element of social mobility. It's baked into the national consciousness and the national zeitgeist, and it has been for hundreds of years <laughs> since since the beginning. Um, yeah. And the time span has shortened. It used to be I'm the the product of, of Jewish immigrants from Europe who you know they came over um, in the 1930s. Uh, the time span used to be two or three generations, maybe, right? Mm -hmm. um, now you see it in one generation. Son of immigrants, daughter of immigrants. There was a number of these kids at Princeton. There were a number of these kids in my boarding school um, yeah. who, within a matter of a decade, basically, or, or you know, 20 years, if the parents are arriving, the kids are at an Ivy League school or, or whatever equivalent. Um, so that I, mean, I think that that's America. That's 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 worth pointing out. But I want to I want to come back to to a question about constitutions. Um, and by the way, there was some like wrestling going on. I don't know. It sounded like a dog, maybe or something. Oh, uh, sorry about that. That's my dog Bates. He <laughs> was uh, scratching on the floor behind me. He does that in his sleep. Okay. <laughs> um, what kind of dog is it? He's a golden. A golden, okay, yeah. beautiful. Yeah, I've been we're, seeing, we're... <laughs> I've been seeing these Bernice Mountain dogs around, um, and I'm like, I gotta get one, but I travel too much. Who's gonna take care of the dog? <laughs> so, Those are serious dogs. That big, is yeah, a, of, that's a size dogs. of these. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Have you yeah. seen the Tibetan mastiffs? I have once seen one. Yeah, they are <laughs> frightening, so frightening creatures. They're yeah. they're not dogs; they're yeah, lions. Yeah. I mean. Yes, yes, yes. They're rideable lions. Yes. Yeah, enormous, yeah. enormous. But look, many countries, Morgan, have constitutions. Yes. What's unique about our constitution? Ours is honest. <laughs> yeah. Ours is meant to actually do. Ours is meant to be followed. It's actually honest. We have failed at times, many times. Sometimes it has taken, the 14th Amendment took over 100 years to actually be followed. Uh, but it is meant to be read by ordinary people. It's meant to be understood by ordinary people. It's meant to be debated among ordinary people. And it really is meant to govern the society of flawed humans. And those flawed humans will attempt to violate it. Uh, but it is meant to actually be followed. The, the thing that's fascinating in the current day is people mention the uh, Chinese constitution or mm. the Russian constitution. And yes, <clears throat> both societies do have written constitutions, but they are in no sense something that should be described with the same word. Often words are applied. Mm. To okay. describe the same thing, because it is a written document, but it is not really 
uh, constitution because they're fundamentally dishonest. I think what people don't really fully follow about the Chinese constitution is that when it says you have freedom of religion, and everyone knows that is absolutely not true, <laughs> and all Chinese know that this is a lie, and the Chinese know that there are a million people in concentration camps because they're Muslims in Xinjiang in Western China. And if you ask Chinese students who are visiting the United States, they'll deny that that's true, or then they'll say that, oh, there's only a few of them, or that, oh, there's a terrorist who deserve it. And then some of them, if you can really uh, get them to open up, will admit that, yes, they do know about it, but they're not supposed to say this. Mm. But everyone knows that the Chinese constitution is not just being violated by accident. Mm. It is an expression of power, the power to lie. If you can, as a government, push people around, that's one thing. But if you can write down a lie, make the citizens repeat it and say it's true, even though mm. they know it's a lie, Mm. And you can demonstrate to everyone that not only do you have the power to abuse citizens, but you have the power to lie about it, make them lie about it, and make it all very clear that you have this immense power to lie. That's what the Chinese constitution is. It's a mm. demonstration of their power to lie, not in any way a constraint on the government. It's a public demonstration of the unconstrained nature of the government. And as soon as you realize that it's a propaganda mechanism, it's not honest in any way, it's a demonstration of power, uh, then you realize it shouldn't even be called the same word. You can call it the Chinese constitution, but that's not what it is. You can call it the Russian constitution, it's the same thing. That's also a demonstration of the power to lie. Uh, so it, it's, I find it frustrating when people sort of try to make comparisons between the U.S. constitution and many other constitutions of the world, which are fundamentally not honest. I, I think about a lot of what went on in the Soviet Union and in you know Eastern Bloc countries. And I had a a, a former podcast guest, this, this guy David Samuels. He's a wonderful, wonderful writer. Um, he writes cultural commentary. He used to be you know write these long magazine essays for Harper's um, all throughout the '90s in the Atlantic and the New York Times Magazine and a bunch of other places. Um, but he's the the son of of Russian immigrants. And mm. we talked a little bit. This wasn't really the theme of our conversation, but we talked a little bit about a society where there man like manifested everywhere is just this version of unreality. You know, you see one thing and you're told that your eyes are deceiving you. Like you learn that you can't yeah. trust your own eyes and also that you can't say certain things. You know, you like mm -hmm. parents would have to be careful about what they said around their kids, lest the kid inadvertently repeat this uh, in the classroom. And then they get labeled, you know, a thought. Um, mm -hmm. And I wonder if, that is ever sustainable like this we are absolutely capable of deceiving of deceiving ourselves of of not being able to trust our own eyes there is this famous um i think it was a solomon ash line test where basically you know there's three lines yeah. and one is shorter than the other two and yeah. there's there's three stooge judges and the, the participants come in and the judges say that the shorter line is longer than the longer lines and some insignificant, uh, some uh, significant minority uh, or if not majority of the participants agree, like it was a glaring difference, you know, and they said the shorter line is, is in fact longer than the longer lines out of some conformative impulse. Um, and I, I, I read that in, in The Better Angels of Our Nature. That's uh, Stephen Pinker. Um, it's so revealing. Uh, and I, like, I just wonder how, if you, if you reproduce that on a mass scale, nobody is starving. But like, 
but people are starving. Like I myself don't have food and my neighbors don't have food. And there's bread lines that are going on for hours or there's no gasoline and people need gasoline to, you know, drive cars to get to their, you know, their appointed jobs. Freedom to choose profession. That's another American thing, which I want to talk to you about. Mm. Um, I just wonder what the, it, it, like what the long-term sustainability of an environment of unreality is. I just, it just seems fundamentally unsustainable. I can't think of a single example of, I mean, barring the last 20 years, you know, I don't know. I'm thinking of, of the collapse in, in 1989, but I just, I can't see how in the end, not letting truth be a guiding principle can end well for any individual or country you know you have hit on all kinds of things there that are uh, i think very true of the current moment and into the past and uh, on the ash experiments i show those uh, diagrams in class to uh, demonstrate this effect when i teach political psychology it's one of my favorite things to teach and uh, you know there's two arguments about what the ash experiments were showing the the classic argument is it's conformity that these college students didn't want to take the risk of being criticized mm. by the other people so they knew that they were saying the wrong thing but they mm. just said it to fit in and it's about conformity in this way you know the great lesson of all social psychology is that humans are massively conformist which i'm positive is quite true the other interpretation of the ash experiments is that it's about humility that if you ask the question that you see something and are you going to believe other people or your lying eyes, you might want to believe other people. That if you look at these lines and you think you're sure of what they show, but there's three other people who say the opposite. Think about that for a moment. You're saying that you're, you trust yourself more than those three people. So you think they're idiots and how arrogant do you have to be? To say yeah. you're positive, you're right, and those three people are mm -hmm. wrong. You have to be pretty arrogant, actually. So it could be that you're actually taking information cues from the majority of other people. The problem here, then, is that, and this gets us into the uh, contemporary American campuses and the pandemic, it. is that what cues are you taking from other people? When you get to ideological conformity and coercion and uh, more authoritarian societies that the, the cue that they're learning is which lies to tell. And people are very good at picking up and learning which lies to tell. And I think that's also a part of what is going on in the ASH experiments, that if one of the basic requirements of being accepted by a social group is telling its lies, and people learn which lies give them social acceptance, and they move forward uh, in that way. And then you get to this question of, is that sustainable in any way? Well, you know... That's one of those great questions. In uh, Live Not By Lies, which is a great essay by Solzhenitsyn, he is convinced that there is something to the American experiment and the argument that we're creatures of rights and people want to have a world of individual liberty, which includes not lying. They want the, the freedom of their own minds and they want the freedom to speak in public and they'll pay a lot for that. And the question always becomes how much you can pay for that. And it turns out that when you talk to, for example, contemporary Chinese students, uh, I had this really fascinating experience of teaching Chinese visitors in the United States for the mm -hmm. 10 years prior to the pandemic. And I watched them change dramatically over that time. In the beginning, and this is uh, early, I think it was about uh, 2012 was when I started doing that. Most of the students who were visiting from China, they were very interested in learning about American democracy and they were interested in learning about rights and they had a lot of conversations about that. And then they slowly became less so until right before the pandemic, they had no interest in rights. And they were quite convinced by the argument that the Chinese government was offering them security and money. Yeah. And they'll take security and money over rights. And they started to argue the exact opposite of what they did 10 years earlier, that uh, rights are destructive, the ability to tell the truth is abrasive, that mm. you are much better off living in a conformist society that is wealthy, 
and uh, you don't have liberty, but you have material goods, then in a chaotic society that has liberty, but also has a lot of homeless people, it has a lot of crime, it has a lot of social discord, you don't live with your family, your family doesn't get along anymore because you're divided political ideologies. And they started uh, shifting from asking how they could uh, adopt American virtues to wondering why those were virtues. Mm. A, r- a remarkable sort of uh, transition going on there. So I don't know the answer to the question of how long a society can uh, live in uh, sort of tensions of misrepresentation. Uh, the, the Chinese are doing well with it, um, though they're having their own economic problems now. And I'm hopeful that uh, the tide will shift in a meaningful way. But I do think that we live in times where misrepresentation is the spirit of the times. Misrepresentation is the zeitgeist in America right now, I think, uh, which uh, would have deeply disappointed Solzhenitsyn. But we seem to have accepted the argument that um, misrepresentation is not only rampant, but accepted. When you were talking about the Solomon Ash line experiment, mm-hmm. I, I can understand the humility argument to that. I guess what I think of is if we expand a little bit and then expand a little bit more and, and it's not just, <clears throat> it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's, you know, outside of an experimental setting, you get more and more participants. You all right? Yeah, I'm just looking. There's this yeah. glare on here. There, it's, it's coming through my window. There is, the, uh, there is a the, glare. I noticed the sun. <laughs> the sun has shifted. That's that's not a halo above my head that's making me look <laughs> angelic or anything. That's a uh, uh, that's that's a glare of the sun shifting. Uh, happy to. I mean, that looks a little bit better. But <laughs> um, I see your dog in the background. Okay, good. Um, good, good. I guess. What you know, Pinker, he might have been citing someone else. I, I happen to have reread this chapter recently, um, so I don't know if it's his idea or he's citing whichever other uh, experimenters um, did this. He talks about pluralistic ignorance, where the society at large can take on an idea, mm-hmm. can take on a belief that none of the individual participants actually adhere to. So if you're in the Solomon Ashland experiment, just going along with what you think the group believes, and the group mm-hmm. is going along with what they think you believe because you just agreed to it, you can get a whole group yeah. of people yeah. to do something that none of the individuals actually want to do. I uh, think that a lot of human psychology of conformity leads in that direction. But I also think it's more complex than that. That you know, there's some really interesting evolution psychology foundations mm-hmm. for this that people I will, love this stuff. <laughs> per, yeah, yeah, yeah. People will personally and collectively misrepresent mm. uh, because it's much more in their personal interest to do so, uh, which has all these collective problems that then happen. Uh, if you haven't ever read, uh, anybody listening to this, uh, if you haven't ever read uh, On Bullshit by Harry Frankfurt, the little black book, yeah. Yeah, it's this really brief read. It's really fascinating. It'll change your life. Uh, Frankfurt draws this really important distinction. And, you know, there's a scholarly distinction between lies and bullshit. And uh, bullshit is when you don't know whether you're lying or not, which is to say you don't know if it's true or not true. You just don't care. Huh. Your your goal isn't truth-seeking. And it turns out that in evolutionary sense, it makes much more sense that our goal is not truth-seeking. Our goal is the acceptance of the group. And the way you get acceptance of the group is by pandering to the group and making them laugh. And if you can present yourself as charming, Regardless of whether it's true or not, the best answer isn't, oh, do I say the thing that's true or the thing that is false? The best answer is to say the thing that is charming. Mm. Uh, and there's this guy named Hugo Mercier who's written some fascinating stuff on this that I really recommend. And he really bluntly lays it out uh, that the goal of most humans is actually to be sexually attractive, not to either promote their own welfare or the welfare of the group. Uh, And then you ask the question that seems rather obvious once you phrase it, um, 
what's better for your goals is it to be right or funny. And ask yourself this, the, you know, the, the guy who's trying to impress a girl, uh, uh, is it better to be smart or funny? Is it better to be right about the world in a way that is not falsifiable or to be uh, humorous in a way that's obvious? And it turns out that bullshitting is actually evolutionarily progressive. Oh. And once you realize that, <laughs> and uh, is it explains, regressive? Uh, progressive for you. Oh. It's, it's actually, uh, it's, it's, it's to your advantage. Yes, um, yes. Bullshitting is to your advantage. Yeah. And, and helps you get laid. That is the way it, uh, Mercier phrases it. I was trying to avoid using that term, uh, but that's right. And well, uh, once you no. realize that, then it, it really changes your perspective on truth and lying. Uh, I think, but I mean, I've not read Mercier. The idea that we're constantly trying to optimize our fitness and that the subconscious forces at play are, are all, you know, telling us to have babies and, and mm. encouraging us to pick suitable partners so we can pass on our genes. Um, well, yeah, the part they don't mention is that lying helps you do that. The, the, the whole evolutionary idea, if you imagine on a scale of one to 10, whatever you think I, that is. Is that true? Or, is, is that, is I mean, is that empirically true? true that lying helped? Uh, lying could help you do that. Well, no, the, that's not what I mean. I mean that the goal is to be a successful liar. The whole goal of all human evolutionary drive is to be a successful liar in this sense that if you imagine humans on a fitness scale of one to 10, whether mm -hmm. it's just one to 10 of attractiveness or of um, uh, fitness or intelligence or wealth or whatever it is, and you know that you're a seven on this scale of humanity, your goal is not to match and have children with a seven. Your, match is, your goal is to match and have children with an eight, nine, or 10. Mm-hmm. But that person who's the other eight, nine, or 10, their goal is to match across or up also. So you have to actually trick them to match upward. You have to lie. You have to misrepresent where you are on the scale. I, that, I, I don't know that that's you're, true. You're lying by definition. Well, this is no, Mercier's I, argument. I'm this, convinced yeah. it makes sense to me. But his argument <laughs> is that the, yeah. the evolutionary drive is false uh, by definition. That it, it's a, it's a, it's, it encourages a uh, human psychology of misrepresentation. I can understand, like, I have not read Mercier, so it's not really fair for me to critique him without having read the book. However, from these sound bites, I guess I'll say, as far as fitness goes, I don't, I think that lying can be conducive to fitness. You know, if you like, you know, I don't know. Uh, it can, I, I can see that li how lying would be conducive to fitness, but I don't think it's a necessary prerequisite to like trick partners into procreating with you. Um, I don't know. We can, we can, we can move. Well, that's not exactly <laughs> what he was saying. He was saying that it's your goal to match above your station as right. uh, okay. George, George W. Hypergamy. Bush. Hypergamy is the word for this. Marrying, marrying up. Hypergamy. Right. Yeah. 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 That. Uh, yeah. I don't know that term, but yeah, that's that's, that's right. Uh, George W. Bush famously he used to say this all the time that he married up, mm. which he, by which he meant a compliment to his wife. Uh, but it also means that there was some reason that she would agree to do this. Uh, it had there had to be a reason why she agreed to marry down. Uh, the argument is that the Mercier's point is that misrepresentation is baked into the cake, uh, and once you realize that bullshitting is a process of pursuing that goal rather than pursuing truth telling uh, or truth as a goal, you realize that we're not necessarily wired for truth. Mm. We're wired for a lot of complex things. And bullshitting, of course, isn't lying. It's just, you just don't care. You might be right. You might not be right. But your goal has nothing to do with that. Other people just assume your goal is to either tell the truth or lie. Your goal is just a social goal rather than a truth goal. That's uh, interesting. It's one of these things. Once you start thinking about that, you start seeing it a whole lot more. I think certainly that truth telling is not necessarily baked into our DNA. There's nothing like necessarily yeah. genetically good about truth telling. I mean, you say like morally yeah. good for a society, but I, I I follow this. I'm I'm going to look up Mercier after this interview. Oh, it's certainly quite interesting. It's it's it really gives you some insight into why philosophy is so unnatural 
But going way back to the beginning when Socrates is saying that people should just openly admit in a humble way that they don't know a lot. But we don't do that. <laughs> yeah. People misrepresent their knowledge base constantly. It's just a, <laughs> it's a, it's a, a shocking degree of bullshit in terms of how people are trying to um, pursue social goals rather than truth goals about what they know. As uh, you know, I, I like to say the three uh, most unused words in America are not I love you. Yeah. Or alternatively, they're not, you know, you've lost weight. They're, uh, <laughs> they're I don't know. Yeah. People don't say just, I don't know, nearly enough. You actually have to be kind of arrogant to say, I don't know, which is, sounds kind of intuitive. But what I mean by that is that if you're confident that you know certain things and you have a reputation for knowing certain things, if you admit you don't know other things, no one thinks you're stupid, uh, it's no criticism because you're confident that you're smart about other stuff you can say you don't know this mm. stuff so i always advise uh, faculty to be truly arrogant rather than just a little bit arrogant a little bit arrogant makes you a jerk but truly arrogant if you actually are confident that you know other things you can just admit you don't know other things but you don't mm. hear that a lot in academics because people aren't truly arrogant they're just a little bit arrogant and that's the wrong point on the curve <laughs> um David Samuels, who I mentioned earlier, we broke his interview into two, we broke the interview into two podcast episodes, and we called one of them "I Don't Know" and other good ideas. And you know, he he schlepped around the United States asking people all kinds of questions about all kinds of topics for a decade. Um, you know, I have the book behind me, and then those a lot of those essays, not all of them, are collected in this wonderful collection mm -hmm. called only love can break your heart but i want to i want to get back mm -hmm. to fact perceptions here mm -hmm. or get back uh begin on the on on fact perceptions um could you give us some examples of how fact perceptions might be weaponized to those looking to say i don't know sell you something whether it's a product or to sell you on their political ideology or to get your vote um, or to stir up conflict, how can fact perceptions be weaponized by a savvy manipulator? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've thought about that question in exactly that way. I guess I think about it more in the political realm, that mm. if people know the beliefs about facts or the lies about facts of a mm. specific social group, then they can manipulate your desire to be accepted by that group or your loyalty to that group to make you endorse certain facts that you're quite questionable about, but you will tell the facts of the group. I think that's the dominant effect in American politics right now. Were you thinking more in terms of uh, marketing or in terms of how yeah, advertising I was, works? Yeah, actually, I was thinking about marketing. I mean, I was thinking about marketing from... First, I was thinking about someone trying to get your vote. And then I was thinking, yeah. let's just make this simpler for the audience. Let's think about why you pick one, you know, vacuum cleaner over the other, because the box and the packaging looks nicer, you know, and this one has, they both have the same amount of bad chemicals or whatever, but mm. we choose to ignore it with one because the box is shiny and we not to ignore it with the other. Right. We're like right, two right. people sell identical products. The marketing is different. All the, ingredients are the same but we convince people that one is actually you know there used to be doctors advertising cigarettes you know nine yeah. out of ten doctors smoke camels <laughs> um i'm sure speaking that's of, true <laughs> you know <laughs> I don't... yeah speaking of marketing i think one of the great meditations on this if people have watched the series madman i mm. really recommend this uh, in this discussion of how marketing is both lying and not lying. You know, the, the main character, Don Draper, has entirely misrepresented and invented his life. Mm -hmm. You learn through the series, I don't mean to give any spoilers, but his name sure. is not Don Draper. He yeah. isn't who he claims to be. He has manufactured his entire life in the same way that he manufactures marketing. Mm -hmm. And one of the great scenes is about cigarettes, where it's, uh, I think it's Lucky Strikes. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to decide how to market a product that is exactly the same product. And this is the yeah. fascinating thing about cigarettes. Once you realize cigarettes are all the same, they all do it exactly the same 
way and they're exactly the same thing. They just put them in different boxes and try to get people to have these brand loyalties that make no sense because they're actually the same product. And the thing about uh, Lucky's is he's having the executive describe how they make cigarettes. Yeah, I remember says, well, the you know, they take it and then they toast it. He's like, wait a minute, you do what? I was like, well, yeah, when we, we toast the tobacco and roll, it's like, no, 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 no. yours are toasted. And the uh, executive says, son, they're all toasted. And he says, yeah, but people don't know that. See, yours are toasted. And even <laughs> though, because it, it just sounds nice. Mm-hmm. And even though that's what they call paltering. Paltering is this really important phrase in the psychology of lying that paltering is telling a lie with the truth. You mm-hmm. are telling something that is technically true. It is technically true that all that these cigarettes are toasted. And you're giving the impression that you know it's a lie, yeah. that they're different or distinct, when you know mm-hmm. that's not true. But you didn't yeah. lie. They're yeah. toasted. But you're not yeah. lying. You're just giving a false impression uh, through a truth. Paltering is a very popular and uh, shockingly uh, influential form of lying in the current day. A lot of what, if you take it to the discussion of the university presidents to 7 October and they're in front of Congress, the paltering was shocking. They didn't lie. They said technically true things, but we all knew they were lying. They were using truths to tell lies, and using mm. truths to tell lies is a real art form in the well, it always has been, it, it, but it's it, in the current day, in the age of misrepresentation, it is particularly interesting. So three, three quick things here. First of all, I used to smoke Lucky Strikes. Well, there you um, go. But I why Lucky's? To... <laughs> why, why, why did you pick Lucky's? The reason I picked Lucky's is because they had these crushable menthol balls in them that you could crush the menthol ball and then... There was no menthol in the signal and Marlboro's, whatever. It, like, it, Marlboro also ended, made crushables. But you, when you would inhale, there was no there was no mint in the tobacco leaf. It was pure. To, it was clean tobacco, okay. not clean. There was probably all kinds of shit in there. It was tobacco leaf. The menthol ball was in the filter. I smoked as a teenager. Not the most proud of it. I don't smoke anymore. I don't vape either. Um, but when you're talking about Lucky's. I it's like you know, fond memories. <laughs> But and then <laughs> well, at least it was a real reason. That was a distinguishing factor. It wasn't just no, some um, no thing that, no, but it was because because Marlboro made clicks as well, and other cigarette companies made the crushable mm. ones. The truth is, is you know when I was fourteen or fifteen or however old I was, um, I got a pack of Luckies and I liked the packaging and the font, and mm. I thought it was cool. Um, so there's there's that you know I, I never ran tests as to how different the cigarettes actually were. Yeah, right. Yeah, I hear the, that they're not. I don't smoke, but the uh, I don't, some people I've known who smoke Luckies. It was because of the cultural resonance with World War II. It felt like an old school cigarette. It felt mm-hmm. like a, a traditional sort of 1940s 1950s cigarette, <laughs> which is just um, feel and pretense. There's nothing about the cigarettes that makes them so. No, I mean, not, I mean, you could have packs that like, cigarettes keep for a while. I don't know if they keep for, you know, better part of a of a century. But um, it's it's interesting. Like I did smoke when I would smoke Newports, for example. This might be like an elite. I, I don't care. It sounds maybe it's elitist. Maybe it's not. Um, I'm not a cigarette connoisseur. Newports are like they're cheaper. They're whatever. Mm. Um, I, fe- I like I felt sick. I had like. <laughs> <laughs> it hurt my th- it hurt my throat um and so they're not when, the kind doctors smoke no not the guy not the you know exactly newport wasn't nine out of ten doctors did not smoke newports um so there's some difference there's some difference between whiskeys you know i'm also oh there's a lot not, of difference between whiskeys uh, this is something okay, i know more about there's a lot of difference uh among but, but how much yeah. difference is there morgan and how much is the glass bottle in the marketing I am at, at a high level. There's the the bottles help, uh, but it's the whiskey that does the work. Uh, they they the all whole, work. Uh, they, but all, they, <laughs> all the, they all do. They work. all do the same thing. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, the uh, bourbons are really different, and different scotches are really different. And, but uh, bourbon so. and the, okay, bourbon and scotch are different. You know, single I mean, malt scotch them, is different. I mean, let's say, let's say among bourbons, the bourbons, can you really taste the difference? 
Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, it is not like uh, cigarettes. Maybe I can't say it because I've never smoked cigarettes, but <laughs> I hear that they're all pretty much the same. The uh, No, no, uh, uh, whiskeys are remarkably different. What about vodka? Yeah. Vodka is just tasteless by definition. I've never understood vodka. It's it's something that I think it's a complete misrepresentation. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong about this, that different vodkas are very different because the goal of a vodka is to taste like nothing. So, well, this one tastes like more of nothing than this one. Uh, so I've never understood that. But among among the uh, the brown liquors, they are remarkably uh, distinct in a very enjoyable way. Uh, <laughs> by the way, I don't know if this is a good idea or not a good idea, but I'm considering sure. starting a podcast uh, called Pleading a Fifth. Okay. Not pleading the fifth. Pleading, pleading a, a pleading a fifth. Okay. And it's going to be a discussion of contemporary constitutional cases, mm -hmm. the ones that are in front of the Supreme Court. And it's going to be my shtick. And and my shtick, if you don't know this, is to explain as accurately as possible the two sides of it. This is the living view. This is the original view. Uh, and you should fully understand both of these arguments. And then mm -hmm deliberate out and decide what you think of it. But I find most commentators just give one side of it. It's, uh, it's remarkably incomplete. They're not honestly describing the two sides of it. And it's always been my goal to be able to do that and do it honestly so people can actually weigh these things. And my idea is to have a different fifth of whiskey uh, for each episode. And I will explain which bourbon it is, what the differences are, which is the whole point. There are actually these remarkable differences in uh, <laughs> bourbons. And then to have a drink while I explain over about 10 minutes uh, the ins and outs of these cases and plead a fifth, uh, finish the drink, and then move on. What do you think? Good podcast. I, I, that sounds great. <laughs> I'd watch it. <laughs> That's one of my plans in the future. When I have time, which I don't know when that will be, uh, because I'm shockingly uh, overworked and busy these days, but all for a good cause. I like it. I like it. Okay, good, good. You know, it's <laughs> funny you mentioned about whether th this is actually a really good example of disputed facts and misrepresentation in the current day. You know, I wrote a whole book on this with Dave Barker, mm -hmm. uh, One Nation, Two Realities, about our disputed perceptions of reality and why that is and how that works politically. One of the great topics of the current day. We started thinking about it way back in 2012 when it seemed to us something important was happening about the nature of polarization. It had moved into this new wave that we're not just polarized about party and ideology and religion, that it had moved into polarization of perceptions of reality. And mm -hmm. this, this question of, is it real or bullshit that cigarettes are different? Is it real or bullshit that bourbons are different? And as a bourbon drinker, I can tell you that I think it's actually real. But you could argue, well, that's just misrepresentation and marketing bullshit, right? It's not easy to know. And it's, it, it, I would argue that with bourbons, you can actually drink enough of them, which I have, to know that they're different. There's an empirical reference. But with so many things, there's just not. You have to trust. And this is actually, I think, something that people really don't fully understand that is at the heart of divided perceptions of reality, dueling fact perceptions, as Mark and I call them, uh, and the politics of facts. Mm. And there's this whole new scholarly field of uh, facts and politics, which didn't used to be a scholarly field because of this new kind of misrepresentation and polarization. And I think one of the key insights is that so much of this is about trust. People walk around thinking that they can observe and discern for themselves all of these facts of the world. They can tell about climate change. They can tell about the power of racism, or whether it's declined or not. They can tell uh, whether marijuana is dangerous or not. They can tell <clears throat> whether uh, gender differences are real or not, or transgender identity is a real thing or not a real thing, or whether vaccinations work or not, or whether the national debt is real or not, or how much threat there is from terrorism or not. And they mm -hmm. think they can discern all these things. That is simply fundamentally not true. Most of our perceptions of facts, we get from trusted sources. Mm. We believe the experts who tell us this. We believe media figures who report this. Mm -hmm. If you honestly assess how much of important political reality you can observe and determine on your own versus how much you are dependent on trusted sources, that second category is by far the massive bulk of it. So we're dependent on trust. And once you realize that, that you actually are trusting other people to tell you about the world, and then you realize the second part of it, that Americans no longer trust the same things. We don't 
all trust universities. Trust in universities has gone massively down. We don't trust the same media. We don't trust the same uh, political leaders. We don't trust the same groups in society. And then you realize that if perceptions are grounded in trust and trust has fractured, perceptions absolutely will fracture as well. And that's mm. where we are. So a couple of things come to mind. Also, I want to mention this before I forget it because it's on my notepad. This is probably way beneath your pay grade and <laughs> is it above or level of not, scholarly sure. interest. No, yeah. below, far, far below. This is like airport it's all, reading. It's all <laughs> perspectival, the, but good. The, the, it is, it is perspectival, but it is, this is like airport level, like um, reading. But there's this hilarious book called Syrup that I read when I was about 15 by Max Barry. It was his debut novel. Uh, I think it was published in 99, 1999, not 1899. <laughs> um, it's called Syrup, and it's about, uh, it's sort of about Coca-Cola, but it's also about th this guy, he comes up with this soda brand, and he calls it F Fuck, like F-U-K-K, -K, um, or F-U-U-K-K, -K, so something ridiculous. Um, and the whole book is like this crazy, ridiculous plot about marketing this soda uh, right. product that he's come up with. Um, and there's intrigue and espionage and it's, it's fun. Um, so syrup would recommend. Um, now on the subject of facts, and you mentioned a whole litany of issues from the threat of terrorism to, you know, oh, yeah. climate change, like yeah. the basic, we're divided the, on all of these things on, and many more. Yeah. On all, every single issue that you mentioned is a hot button topic and is hotly debated in yeah. contemporary American life. It reminds me of when I was living in Australia, I lived in Bondi beach in this, uh, uh, it was an, it was an apartment. Um, but like every apartment in that building was filled with just like internationals and backpackers and other transients. Um, there was a lot of tomfoolery that <laughs> That went on in there and just ridiculous things. Um, it, actually, the building was owned by this guy who he was a professional. He was an Australian guy, but he was a professional baseball player in the U.S. for 20 years. Went back to Australia, bought this five unit building and just, you know, I don't know how compliant that was with anything. But I lived in there with these two Irish guys. Uh, they worked in construction, uh, a Colombian girl who like cleaned people's houses and an Italian guy who worked at a pizza restaurant and the Italian and the Colombian, this is not, this is not relevant. The, the Italian and the Colombian were in a relationship, but they didn't speak the same language. And they constantly argued or he would yell at her in Italian and she would yell at him in Spanish and they would get like 20% of what the other one said. And then they would continue yelling. Um, and it was, that, it was very. That, I've heard the story. That that sounds like American politics in the, <laughs> the, the current day. They understand twenty percent and just keep on yelling. But that whole time you're telling that story, I kept expecting you to say, "And they all walk into a bar and." Yeah. Um, no. So the reason I tell this story is because one day this Irish guy, you know, I don't know, he wasn't one of my roommates. Maybe he was one of their friends, or he walked in through the backyard. There was a lot of strangers in that backyard, but. Um, and there was an Irish guy in the house, and he didn't know who the president of the United States was. He didn't know who the the, the president of Ireland was, um, mm -hmm. or is it prime minister? I, is it, I can't remember. They have a Westminster. They have a Westminster system. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, anyway, he did like he didn't know who uh, the premier of New South Wales was, which is the state we were in. We were in Sydney. Um, he just and. I, like we weren't like sitting there like making fun of him. He just he said, "I don't watch the news. I don't read newspapers. Yeah. I go to work. I, yeah. you know, watch Netflix. I hang out with my girlfriend, and I that's my life. Like I don't do that." And at, at the time, I was an editor at a magazine, um, and like a cu cultural commentary magazine, and so I was rather steeped in the the goings on of of yeah. world politics. This guy was on the total other end of the spectrum. He didn't know. He didn't care. He wasn't on Twitter. Uh -huh. um, and which and one was happy? Which one was happier? <laughs> yeah, I think you know the answer to that, Morgan. <laughs> um, but I, 
I, I just, I have come to believe that the issues are not really the issues. All the issues you described are not really the issues. They are totally manufactured. And this is not an original idea. Noam Chomsky, of course, wrote Manufacturing Consent. Matt Taibbi, who's been on this podcast, wrote in 2008, um, uh, was it called Hate Inc., How Today's Media Makes Us Despise One Another. Um, Joan Didion in 2001, uh, about whom I wrote my undergraduate thesis, wrote a book called Political Fictions, um, which was, you know, she wrote about the sort of group of think tank people and, and, and policy advisors and whatever that she said, year in and year out, invent the narrative of public life. That line sticks in my head. And I was talking, I don't know the exact statistics, but I was talking to Coleman Hughes on this podcast, who you might, you might be familiar with him. Oh, yes. um, he, uh, he said like 20, it's like less than 20% of Americans are actually on Twitter. And I don't really, I have a Twitter. I don't really use it. Um, hmm. Like I check Twitter, like not often. Um, but we t- speak as if it's deeply influential and, and normal Americans. Twitter users it's speak not. as if it, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> political pundits speak as if the Twitter sphere is very influential and important. It really matters what people say. Yeah, on but Twitter. no, it is. And, it is influential and important. That's not what I'm getting at. I, I get the point I'm getting at from Chomsky, Diddy, and Taibbi, in a not straight line. I think manufacturing consent was mm-hmm. '88. Diddy in was 2001. Uh, Taibbi was 2008, is that these issues that characterize American life now and that become the the things that are discussed in campaigns, gubernational campaigns, and then presidential campaigns, um, they're not, they don't mean any, like, why did we all of a sudden start talking about X issue? Because some pundits on Twitter decided, like, told us to, we, they said, you should care about this. You have to care about this, right? So I, I think, mm-hmm. I think about this Irish guy who I met in Sydney, and maybe yeah. this is naive, you know, I think about this Irish guy who I met in Sydney, who wasn't on social media, didn't watch the news, didn't read the news, didn't use Twitter. And th- those issues didn't trickle down to him because he wasn't like receiving them anywhere. I don't know. Yeah, you understand a little bit of. What, yeah, I think I, I don't, do I don't see know if I have a point. Somewhere you're I'm going thinking out loud. That, um, <laughs> I would guess that he is the happier man for it, in the sense that the polarization and vitriol has driven people away from politics, mm. and so the appearance of it. Well, you're talking about the people who are running it and attempting to manipulate it. In their, it's not even uh, one person. I'm not like saying there's a cabal. It's a whole system. No, no, no. Of... There's many, many different people, right? That uh, all of the different deep ideologues are trying to manipulate the system toward their own ideology. But people in, who aren't deep ideologues are pushed away and disgusted by this. So more and more people, even well educated people, are retreating from politics and leaving the field to the extremists. And the field looks more and more bloody because it is. And because uh, media have bifurcated so much, they have more incentive than they used to mm. to try to stir up the pot. And that's how they get enough eyes and clicks from a smaller and smaller number of people who match their particular perspective. But they have to rile them up in order to get them to um, reach their going back to advertising and Mad Men in order to sell that advertising mm-hmm. to them. So people in the current world have a deep incentive to make you upset and annoyed. Well, and I, I that's think... why more and more people are upset and annoyed. Yeah, I'm not the first person to say this. <laughs> I just think that, yeah, I think there's a lot to this. And it relates to the informational problem because people, some of them are trying to bullshit you in the sense that they're just trying to socially impress you. They don't care if they're lying or not. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people know that they are misrepresenting and mm-hmm. they are. Uh, willing to do so, and they know they can do so uh-huh. uh, because people will accept uh, what they're saying. And then many, many other people don't know if they're misrepresenting or not because it's actually just so hard to know in the current day. There's this argument you mentioned at the very beginning about this question of a society that is lying about certain things or misrepresenting or even just uncertain about uh-huh. things. 
can really prosper and survive over time. There's this old uh, John Adams line that people like to, to trot out when they speak about divided perceptions of reality or dueling facts. Uh, and John Adams uh, famously said that facts are stubborn things. Yeah. And people quote this a lot and say, oh, well, you know, as John Adams said, facts are stubborn things, as if it were obvious that the true fact, by which they always mean their perception of facts, will out over time. Now, this was uh, John Adams, not Sam Adams. Sam Adams had a fuzzier perspective, as we were saying. Sam Adams um, in the, My Fridge, My Six Pack yes, here? Yes, his cousin. Okay. That was, yeah, that was... Uh, the, the beer rather than the bourbon. But yeah, he had a fuzzier perception of reality. But they say that Sam, no, he had the fuzzy one, that John had the more clear-minded perception. Uh, but here's the part that they leave out. Uh, that phrase, when he said that, that is when he was acting as the defense counsel for the British soldiers, the Redcoats, mm -hmm. who shot the Americans at the Boston Massacre. He was defending them, mm -hmm. saying that they had not committed a crime, they had not killed innocent people, and that they had, in fact, been fired upon first. And the stubborn fact that John Adams was referring to was that the Boston Massacre never happened. Now, interestingly, I was never taught that stubborn fact. In fact, when I was in elementary school, middle school, and high school, I was taught that the Boston Massacre was actually the thing that happened. John Adams is saying that facts are stubborn and reality will always out. He was referring to the exact opposite reality, not the one that actually took hold and has been taught to students ever since. I think it's a pretty decent demonstration that his entire point about uh, facts are stubborn is not entirely right, because those facts weren't stubborn at all. And I think in the current day, it's getting worse and worse in that sense, and that we don't have a consensus authority that is forcing people to agree upon facts. So to, to cite a, another literary source in uh, Lord of the Flies, yeah. and I really love this because it, it, the book influenced me a great deal. And uh, uh, David Barker, David Barker, my co-author, has this phrase that uh, instead of having a marketplace of realities, oh sorry, a marketplace of opinions, we now have a marketplace of realities that people yeah. can choose among That's these. Jewish. I wish I thought of this phrase, but it was uh, David's phrase, the marketplace of reality has, has taken over. Uh, another one, and this is from an, another guy named Colt, that uh, we no longer have a two-party system. We have a two-reality system. Mm -hmm. Again, I wish I had thought of either one of those phrases, but I just steal them from other people. But uh, <laughs> one that I particularly like is that we now have an informational lore that flies, that we are just fighting in this brutal way about different perceptions of reality. And in the book, Lord of the Flies, there is this great line that I love that in the very beginning, you know, the story is that the boys are stranded on this island from this uh, mm -hmm. plane crash. It's not and a, in the very, is it a, I think it's a, is it is a it plane crash or a boat crash? I don't remember. Anyway, go ahead. It might have been a, it might have been is a, it a boat crash. or a plane. I think it was a plane. I think it was a plane. I'm not sure. Yeah, because they got rescued by a boat. Um, but they're stuck on the island. And in the very beginning, they think, oh, we're just going to get rescued, and they don't take any kind of organization seriously, and they're just running around doing things. Um, they get organized and start um, killing each other later. Uh -huh. but in the beginning, it's just kind of chaotic. And there's this great line where Golding writes that the island had, did not yet have the power to make them recognize reality. The reality yeah. was they were stuck there, but they didn't want to believe it. They were just denying the reality mm -hmm. in front of them. But the island had no power to make them recognize it. Not yet. But within about a week, the island gained the power to make them recognize the reality that they were screwed. Mm -hmm. uh, no one has the power to make us recognize that we are misperceiving reality any longer. Because we have lost the gatekeepers and the authorities that we used to trust. Universities are one of them. I've been deeply critical of universities, how they have lost this sense of authority. And if you've been watching the survey evidence on this, uh, mainstream Americans across parties, but especially in the middle and the right, are less and less trusting of universities and less mm. and less believing that faculty are not just ideologues and universities have anything to say that is not just curated. 
And that's one of the reasons that uh, divided perception of reality have become so dominant because we don't have an authority that can convince anyone to believe in any one reality any longer. Well, I heard there's some people in Texas who were so fed up, they set up their own university. I've heard of these people. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think my biggest argument in favor of the University of Austin, UATX, is that... Where you're now, you've taken on a deanship. Mm -hmm. I am the Dean of Economics, Politics, and History, essentially Dean of Social Science. And um, I, it, depending on which conversation I'm having, I, I talk about my favorite innovation of the new university. And one of them is the interdisciplinary nature of mm -hmm. it. Uh, within, essentially, the School of Social Sciences, the Center for Economics, Politics, History, there are no departments or majors. because. Departments and majors were never actually designed for the benefit of students. The, if you're trying to understand the world as a student, the world is not divided up into economic things and political things and historical, Hist historical things. things. Yeah, you want to understand and study all of these things and apply them as needed to try to understand uh, society. So it's fundamentally interdisciplinary for the faculty and the yeah. students. And the faculty have the opportunity to publish wherever they want, to whatever interests them, to work with other people across. Uh, different approaches without these normal kinds of boundaries. And I particularly enjoy that because as you know, from our conversation, I'm a fundamentally interdisciplinary guy. I was an undergrad in political science and economics and then took a master's degree in history. And I was told I didn't think like a historian. I started <laughs> off as a, as a graduate student in economics and I was told I didn't think like an economist. And uh, then I eventually ended up in political science mm. where you can get away with a lot. And uh, then, but I really studied over in the psychology department mm -hmm. and was a TA in psychology and studied <laughs> in the law school. And I really think that's how you can put things together. So one of my favorite things about UATX is that it's fundamentally you know, disciplinary. Uh, my other favorite thing about it today is that uh, it's a, a group of people who decided that new institutions, founding a new institution, is actually an utterly normal thing to do. And it used to be that in the history of the United States, we've spoken about different things that make the United States unusual. But if you go back to the original Tocqueville idea that associationalism is one of the unique features of the United States, and Americans from the founding until very recently, when there looked to be a need in society, we would just form a new institution. Mm -hmm. And that's how most universities found it. Throughout the whole 1800s, early 1900s, it was utterly normal to found and build new universities. There were a lot of experimental ones. Some of them succeeded, some of them failed. Uh, some of them, like the University of Chicago, became famous and changed American academics. Chicago was quite innovative at its time. Johns Hopkins was a brand new idea about graduate studies and it influenced everybody else. These kinds of innovations used to be and should be normal. But mm -hmm. what's unfortunate about contemporary academics is if you say you're going to launch a challenger institution, you have a slightly different idea. You're going to do things a bit differently. Time has come for a new university. We haven't had new universities in America for over 50 years. No one has been founding new schools for a lot of different reasons. But one of them is that it's seen as sort of distasteful by the rest of the university world. It's seen as a, a challenge and an insult. It's not a, it is a challenge, but it's not necessarily an insult. It, it's a normal thing to have new institutions that do things a bit differently. And I became convinced over a long number of years, and then after 7 October, I changed my thinking a lot and became convinced that new institutions were necessary, that a school truly devoted to open inquiry and to civil discourse. And civil discourse is what we need in the United States at this time, where people really can't speak. They can speak freely. Mm -hmm. They're expected to speak civilly at the same time that they speak freely. That my liberty to openly speak demands your liberty to openly speak. And you have the responsibility, and we sincerely believe this at UATX, that you have free speech rights, but you also have the responsibility to back up your arguments with evidence and mm -hmm. reason. And no one will ever be shouted down at the University of Austin, but they might be shown to be wrong. And that's the right standard. No one will be shouted down, but they might be shown to be wrong. And if you have that kind of environment, I think you have a true university where thought and argument and the true growth of individuals, the purpose of universities, excellence, 
will really be accomplished, will really happen. I believe that so much that I left a tenured career and went to a new startup university. And I am now working 24 seven to make that happen <laughs> because I think it's what the world needs. What's this Austin Union you've put together? Yeah, yeah. This is uh, another aspect of the university. And we will see what direction it goes in. We have the first class of students. Is this your project? Uh, it was not oh, my or, idea, uh, actually. No, but you'll, no, be, no. Avi, you'll be involved. Well, I'm the faculty advisor for it. How it goes depends on what the students make of it. Uh, it actually was the uh, brainchild of a woman named Olivia Hagee. And uh, she's a UT law grad uh, who works with the university. And... The idea of the Austin Union is that it is modeled after the Oxford Union, Cambridge Union. It's a debate society. It'll be fully run by students. So we'll see what direction the students take it. Mm -hmm. But the idea is to bring back true debate to American university campuses, where I can attest it is fundamentally lacking because people are afraid of conflict. They are afraid to say things that are in any way controversial because of the mm -hmm. social cost. Uh, but that's from the student faculty perspective. From the administration perspective, they're deeply interested in merely keeping the peace and not having any sort of controversy. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to bring in pairs of speakers who will debate and the students will ask questions and we'll see what direction the students take it in. I'm simply going to advise and uh, give them encouragement. And I have a feeling it's going to uh, take off remarkably. Let me give you an example of what I'm really talking about if people aren't getting the, the point here. Uh, we were saying earlier my undergraduate experience, which was 88 to 92. Mm -hmm. There were three talks that happened when I was an undergrad in the Honors College at the University of Pittsburgh at that time that deeply influenced me. One of them was Angela Davis came to campus, mm -hmm. serious left wing radical. And I watched her speak. She said some radical things. Um, there was pushing and shoving in the audience. The security people had to remove some people. Um, it was an interesting event to watch. And I remember uh, students spoke about this for a long time afterward. The second one was Bill Buckley was on campus, William F. Buckley, the arts conservative, founder of National Review, wrote God Man at Yale. And uh, I remember that Pitt at the time was experimenting with using students who were studying American Sign Language as uh, simultaneous translators. And we do that now normally, but that was not normal at that time yet. And the student translators could not keep up with Buckley because he speaks so fast and with such a high vocabulary that they just got way back in the translation. And Angela Davis and Buckley could not be more opposites, but both of them were welcomed on campus and I saw both talks. And then the third one was Mayor Kahana. And for those of you who don't know who Rabbi Kahana was, he was a very controversial figure in Israeli politics, very right-wing guy, said some things that got him kicked out of the Knesset. And he was making this rather radical, uh, but very influential argument at that time about the nature of Israel as both a democracy and as a Jewish state. And he was pointing out that they quite possibly can't be both. That if they're a democracy, uh, because the Arab population is growing uh, quite rapidly, that they could eventually, through democratic means, no longer be a Jewish state. So they have to decide between being a Jewish state and a democracy. Mm -hmm. And this is a really interesting question, uh, if you think about all the ramifications of what he was talking about. And I went to see him speak on Pitt campus at that time. And while he was on stage, he said very clearly that he knew and understood that his ideas were going to get him killed. That people were trying to kill him at that time. <clears throat> and he was still speaking in public in America and Europe. But he knew they were going to kill him. And he was just going to speak until he died. And I thought this was a bravado at the time. But a couple months later, he was shot dead on the streets in New York City. And that had an impact on how I thought of the world. And here's the point of this story. None of those talks would be allowed on most American university campuses right now. They would not allow someone like Angela Davis to speak. Bill Buckley, if you were around, they wouldn't let him speak. And they would never let Mary Kahana speak on most Why American wouldn't they let Angela Davis speak? Too radical. She would cause problems on campus. Maybe a couple campuses would allow her, but they don't allow the far left or the far right on campuses, or even the mid-left, or, or the mid-left or the mid-right. 
uh, they don't want controversy at all. Uh, they want to shut it down smooth. and have it be gray and smooth and conformist uh, because it's their in their interest to have it be gray and smooth and conformist. Uh, this is terrible. The, the intellectual environment of discussion on American campuses right now is so boring. It is so gray. It is so monochrome. It is so humorless. People are even afraid to tell jokes. I <laughs> was once... Um, brought into my dean's office because I had told a joke in class and it wasn't even funny and it wasn't even a planned <laughs> joke. It was just something off the cuff that I made some reference and people decided to complain. And uh, at the, the time, uh, I remember a senior faculty person said to me, wait, so you were talking about something controversial in class and a student made a joke and then you made a joke? And did you realize how many errors that is? Number one, this said this person, I never speak of controversial things in class anymore. What? Because it, it'll just bring me trouble. Why would you do that? And then secondly, you don't let your students make jokes. And then thirdly, you shouldn't be making jokes. And I thought... It's nuts. And said, if I... I generally teach uh, about ideology and I teach about constitutional conflict. If I didn't talk about controversial things, there would be nothing to talk about. Mm -hmm. And this is something that's just the, the death of all intellectual discussion, all intellectual growth, all um, free thought on campus, all humor on campus. Uh, but yet it is the direction it has all trended toward gray conformity. And yeah. I thought about it for a long time that I increasingly felt that I was being coerced into misrepresenting. And I think it's kind of soul destroying in the social needs and sense that if you start living by lies or you start to think that your first question isn't, do I think this is true? But your first question is, can I say this? And you start maybe not lying, but curating. And then you start realizing the other truth that the other faculty to whom you're listening, you don't believe they're telling the truth anymore either, because you know that they're curating and they're asking the same questions. And if you start having conversations with other professors uh, in private, which are very different, and they say, I would never say this in public, or I would never express this to you. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you get to know them, they'll tell you what you really think. And then you realize the ones you aren't close to, they're misrepresenting constantly. And this is the nature of the contemporary universities. And students learn very quickly that there's a script to which they need to stick. And they do not like to depart, again, unless you get to know them, and they will speak in a more honest way with you. But um, honesty, humor, uh, intellectual risk, one of my other favorite innovations about UATX is the Chatham House rule that will be in mm -hmm. effect. And this is a rule. Check your phones at the door. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. That everything that is said in a classroom is meant to be open to intellectual exploration. So you don't have to look around first and think whether somebody is going to out you on social media or someone's going to be horribly upset and report you to the dean because you suggested some idea that was half-baked or you weren't mm -hmm. certain about you can think out loud. And I used to be able to think out loud when I was mm -hmm. a student. I said a lot of stupid stuff when I was an undergrad. Nobody got hurt. It was fine. I learned a lot of things. And the whole purpose of university is to learn these things and mm. to meet people, faculty and students, whom you would not have met from perspectives that you had never heard. I was a working class kid from a very simple neighborhood. And I didn't know any of the cultural breadth. I ran into at university, and that's the whole point. But if you if you have a Chatham House rule, people will say all sorts of interesting things and Hopefully. will grow. You, but, but you, you still don't, no one you will say anything. No, I correct. I mean, I think that it's necessary, but not sufficient. I mean, look, it's it's necessary, but not sufficient. It's certainly better to have it than to not have it. Um, I think you still might run up. Then again, you're at UATX. It's a self-selecting student population. Yeah. You have a lot of things working in your favor. I'm thinking more generally, you still might run into students engaging in curation because for the entirety of their teenage existence, their formative years of their life, what's that um, psychological mechanism by which we remember our teenage years more than any other period in our life? The um, I forget the I forget the exact word for it. I'll look it up. Um, uh, I don't know. 
It's interesting. We remember like the first 20 years of our life more significantly than the, the rest of our lives, basically. I don't know. I don't know why someone coined what this was called. Anyway, these students for the last however many years have been signaled around society. You have to like being signaled from all around. This is acceptable think and this is expectable talk and this is not. So I wonder like, I mean, Chatham Math Rules, UATX, Austin Union, all working in your favor. I just, I wonder how students who don't go to UATX and, and you know, outside of that, who don't have these things working in their favor, can engage in real, meaningful conversations. Because what I've been thinking about throughout this whole interview, which is drawing to a close, I know we're both, we're both getting antsy here. Um, uh, and feel free to, if you've got to jump, feel free to, to, no, to jump. No, I'm actually enjoying it. I, I, there's all <laughs> kinds of things we could keep talking about. But yeah, I just, I didn't realize that we've been going on as long as we have. We're going on for one hour, 24 minutes and 47 seconds. I don't know if anyone uh, is still listening. You can say whatever you want at this point. Everybody, <laughs> everybody's turned off who is listening at this point. Well, you know, it's funny. There was this blind professor. And then I'll, I'll, get, I'll get back to my point. But there was this blind professor, the students that wrote the essays, graded all the essays, and give a lot of people C's, D's, whatever. My English teacher in high school um, told us about this guy. This is a chapter mm. about this English teacher in my first book. I love this guy. Still oh. talk to him. He's in his 80s, um, instilled in me a love of literature that and you know made me want to become a writer. That's lasted to this day. So uh, props to Champ Attlee. So Champ was telling us about this blind professor who – would, you know, grade papers, I don't know if this is high school or college or what. Um, it, was, it must have been college, um, his college. He went to Claremont Men's College. Um, mm. And basically one day, one day a student put in like the middle, I wonder if this guy actually reads these papers because uh, uh, he wouldn't uh, mark anything on the paper. Yeah. He would just give it a grade. Um, and <laughs> the kid got the paper back and the professor had just written, yes, <laughs> I'm reading. <laughs> um, <laughs> no like, grade. Yeah, well, I can't imagine. I'm the not sure what grade that high. is, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> See, and then, I would give extra points. I would give extra points to the student for that. Yeah. The one, the one ballsy thing I I really regret. I was taking this uh, introduction to Western philosophy class, and as a final paper, we had to you know pick a thinker and criticize him. I think I yeah I think I picked I picked um oh I. I can't remember, but I wanted to write, I was writing about Anselm's ontological argument. Um, and I wanted to present this paper as my final paper and say the penultimate ontological argument have like 10 totally blank pages. And then at the end have like a 10 page bibliography, um, no text, no words, no titles, but like cite a bunch of really meaningful stuff. Um, and submit this as my final paper. I was too, I was too, uh, afraid to do this. I was too busy, you know, trying to get into, into college that I didn't yeah. do this. This was in high school. Um, but yeah, yeah. No, I kind of wish that I did. <laughs> There's a story. I don't know if this is true or not, that it, among admissions people that, um, one of the admissions essays for university was, um, I forget exactly the phrase for it, but um, something about risk taking. Have you ever taken a risk? Oh, that's what it was. It was have you describe an opportunity or describe a, a, an event uh, in your life where you've taken a risk and it worked out well? And the student just wrote, fuck you. <laughs> As it in this one, but of course he didn't know if it worked out well for him or not. He was hoping that he would be admitted, and this would be. So you see, it wouldn't have worked out well if they didn't admit him. So they have to admit him now for taking that risk. That's uh, I love that. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. There's I, another one in that is a law school joke that the professor said to answer the essay as succinctly as possible about whether this particular case had been ruled. Um, correctly, and the student just said no. This is the most succinct rendition, and the student gets an F and says to the professor, "Well, you know, you said to speak succinctly. Why? Why isn't that an acceptable succinct answer?" And the professor says, "Have you considered that the most succinct answer was yes?" <laughs> Technically, actually, no is one letter less. 
It is most succinct, yes. Not necessarily most correct. But who knows? Um, it's called the reminiscence bump. The tendency ah, okay. to right. remember right. your that your childhood years the most. You know, I hadn't heard of that before, but that actually intuitively makes sense to me. I do remember my early years, and especially teenage years, way better than I do, I think, the last 20. I'm sure there's an evolved evolutionary purpose to this. We learn more. We learn how to, you know, hunt, battle, and kill, and get along with people and mate when we're young, well, and then... You know, in, an, in an evolutionary sense, people don't like to talk about this, but our minds were only designed to live to about 40. Hmm. That was your prime existence up until 2025. Yeah, I don't talk to anyone who's older than 40. Like I ask, I ask to see their their driver's license, and if they're older than 40, I just I put duct tape on my mouth actually, and I refuse to speak with them. You know, so you can't trust anyone over 35. I've I've heard that before. Yeah, yeah. Um, the duct tape comes out, and I just I stay mute. Sometimes I waddle around kind of. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's ridiculous. I don't even know what I'm saying. Um, okay, here's here's an easy question for you. Um, you know, we're wrapping up. This this should be some light stuff. Um, should there be a constitutional amendment to the number of justices on the court so that politicians stop flirting with packing it like a suitcase? Yes. Yes. It would settle these questions about uh, court packing, which, what you know, should, and that's hard. Ru Ruth Bader Ginsburg was against it. Breyer, who retired recently, he was against it. Joe Biden has been against it. What did he refer to it as? It wasn't nonsense. It was something cruder than that. Could have been bullshit, what we were saying before. But <laughs> um, uh, no, I, I, I am opposed to the idea of court packing. Uh, I think that it's a, a very important thing that we have a stable and understandable court and that the institution be taken seriously. Uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about this, about constitutional politics, but I'm convinced that the whole point of it is that it is meant to be something that citizens discuss and understand, and people therefore shouldn't be mucking with it, that we do need to have a stable court. So an amendment of that nature, I would support. What about the lifetime appointments? They get tenure. <laughs> that is something that has led to some difficulties and people hanging on too long. And why don't and you just serve ten years and you know go become a law professor? Akhil Lamar, who is a very influential legal thinker, uh, Sterling Chair Professor at Yale Law School. I listened to his podcast, Amarca's uh, Constitution. He's a really brilliant guy. The reason that I really respect Amar is that he is politically liberal, but he's convinced that originalism is the right way to read the Constitution. And he, therefore, he is being honest, the thing that is lacking, and comes to some very interesting conclusions that are worth listening to. Often, uh, to a conclusion that is against his own politics, but he's convinced the Constitution means this. It doesn't have to match his politics in order for it to be right, which is not the perspective, but not the uh, perspective that most people take in the current day. But he argues that there should be, I think it's 18 years if you work it out, that if they do an 18-year stint, then that regularizes it of the appointments of presidents. Every president gets two, I think, is the way that works. And that this would give it more of a system rather than the free-for-all in the current day. Mm. Uh, I think there's a lot of argument in favor of that. I think that could be a good amendment as well. All of these things are questions of better or worse. Is A better or is B better? There is no perfect. Whenever you start to argue in government, of, oh, this isn't perfect, that's just sort of obvious. Uh, there is no perfect. There's only better and worse. You have to compare the two institutions. I think uh, Amar has a strong argument on that one. Nor do I think we're going to do it, though. I think we're stuck with the current system. You know, one of the things that we could change is we don't have to have these confirmation hearings and this whole dishonest show that we have. You know, to, to end where we began, I suppose, talking about uh, dishonesty and misrepresentation. Televised, of the televised confirmation hearings. Televised lying. Yeah. No, I mentioned uh, at the beginning that one of the things that really influenced me was the 
Clarence Thomas, Anita Hill hearings that also happened when I was an undergrad. And that was one of the first times in American politics that this new kind of spectacle developed. That on television, you had two people and you could tell that one of them was lying and you had to decide which one it was. And it was sort of a new form of theater in the age of misrepresentation. And we had to look at this on camera and decide which one was lying. Well, we don't know. And we still don't know to this day. You can't know. And it goes back to the Whitaker Chambers, Challenger Hiss time period, where this was literally the first time in in human history, certainly in American history, where literally two different men were on television, because television had just been born at that time. And you had these two men on television. You could tell that one of them was lying and one of them wasn't. They both seemed to be telling the truth. They both were spectacular. One was a spectacular actor and one was telling the truth. You just couldn't tell which one was which. But you had to figure it out. And that has become the increasing nature of American politics. And of course, you know that the Clarence Thomas and Neil Hill hearings were recreated with the Kavanaugh, um, Christine Ford hearings most recently. And I actually did some survey research on that. And it's very clear that people don't know who's telling the truth and who isn't, but they absolutely project their values and their partisan alignment Mm. into which one is telling the truth and which one is lying. Right. So it's not about truth. So it's it's not about truth. It is about ideology and it's about values and it's about your social uh, connections and whether you can say to your group that you think the other person might be lying and still be accepted by that group. And this is a deep problem. But all of the hearings, whether they're about this kind of accusation of sexual misconduct or not, they're all dishonest. But going back to Clarence Thomas also, in the sense that he was asked whether he had ever thought about or, dis- or debated Roe v. Wade. And he had been told to say no, because he is supposed to pretend that he hasn't thought about these things, which everybody knows is not true. And RBG then took the opinion that uh, she could not talk about anything that might come to the court, which gave her an out to refuse to speak about all the things that matter. Mm. And since that time, the hearings have become about personal questions, because they can't be about the things that actually count. So that is fundamentally dishonest. And what the uh, confirmation the, hearings? The confirmation hearings are fundamentally dishonest. Yeah, yeah, because they're not talking about what matters, and they um, people are coached to misrepresent their views. And it all goes back to Robert Bork. And I have some other stories about this. Um, I actually uh, met him right after he was borked in this really odd uh, circumstance. Right after and he was borked. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's why you, when your name becomes a verb, you know that you've done something interesting. And let me end with yeah. this about the nature of lies and misrepresentations. I always found this really fascinating. Uh, I met him once, but I, I, was, I was 17 and I was too young to actually think to ask this question. But the thing about Robert Bork that's really fascinating is that he went in front of a confirmation hearing and told the truth. He actually said exactly what he thought about Roe v. Wade. He said what he thought about how to read the Constitution and constitutional theory. And he was openly honest about everything that he thought. And then they destroyed him with it. And they mischaracterized and misrepresented and attacked him personally and took all of the truth that he had said and used it to deny him this thing that he wanted most in life. He wanted to be a Supreme Court justice. And because he told the truth, they said no. Mm. And that gave them the ammunition. And I've always wanted to ask him this question. If you had known that the one thing you wanted the most in life, they would deny you if you told the truth, and all you had to do was lie, and you would get it, what would he have done? Would he have lied for the seat? And I like to think that the answer is no, that he would not have lied for the seat. And the reason 
that I like to think it is that almost nobody would do that. You mean most people would lie for the seat? All of the nominees since then have. They haven't openly lied, but they have not been fulsome. They have not discussed what they think. All of them took the position after that that I will dodge everything and not discuss mm. what I think because I will not tell the truth and be denied the seat. And that's utterly normal now. That's why they're misrepresentative. That's why they're a show. And that's why they become about personal attacks because there's nothing actually to talk about because they won't talk. They can't. You, you have to be willing to misrepresent to have the seat. And I'm not... Uh, presenting myself in any superior light, and in case you didn't understand what I mean, the reason I like to think that Bork would have told the truth and been denied the seat is I like to think that he's better than I am. Thank you for coming on the show, Morgan. Thank you.